Thank you. Now, I'm really glad you gave us short chairs because I was a bit worried about how I was going to get on those stools. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we've thought about all of the things. Um, first of all, thank you. Oh, thank you thank for you. all of the things. I think everybody here would have seen Susie at some point just help us all understand and guide us. And there was so much going on and you just were like, let me do all the reading while you're asleep <laughs> so that we can wake up on Breakfast <laughs> News and do this. So thank you. You are a microbiologist. You have a lab full of all sorts of wonderful things that can make you sick. <laughs> Infectious disease, tuberculosis. You have done the most incredible research and, and you're an amazing scientist and, and we know you for that. But you also, <laughs> as a side hustle, are a science communicator, yeah. which you do mostly in your spare time because academia <laughs> is busy. Yeah, and it's, and it's uh, you know this really well, it's not something that's really valued by our institutions, unfortunately. Um, no, I left the system because of that. <laughs> so you're still there, so I appreciate yeah. that you're still um, doing this. And, and the reason I, I kept at it was because I just, I just so firmly believe that science is not done once you've just written your peer-reviewed publication. You know, that it's so important that everybody understands what the research is so that they can either build new companies from it or in the case of a pandemic, um, you know, do the right thing. And so that's been my attitude the whole, you know, for the last 10 years. And in many ways, I, I realized now that I was training for a marathon, I didn't realize I was gonna have a run, um, yeah. So I feel like I know your story intimately. So Susie and I, who know each other very well, we've worked together a lot. We're both science communicators, and it's been a journey for you. Now, first, I want to celebrate Susie. These are my Celebrate Susie <laughs> slides. You've done so much. So you have your weekly segment on Radio New Zealand where we just get to learn about three new pieces of science that you've read about. You do a whole bunch of communication. You visit places. You give talks. Um, you wrote a book for everybody to understand. I read this, Antibiotic Resistance. For those of you who are worried, by the way, be really worried when you read this book. You should, this is the next, yeah, be very worried. You write books. You also do a whole bunch of things in the, and scientists don't do this very often, but making it accessible and fun. And so what is this? This is um, living art. So every one of those squares you can see is a Petri dish, but it's 25 centimeters by 25 centimeters. Um, and what we did was we gave artists Petri dishes and a little solution of bacteria, harmless bacteria that glows in the dark. And we basically got them to paint, essentially like painting on jelly with invisible ink. And then wherever they painted, the bacteria would grow overnight and wherever they grow is where they glow. And so the next day they've made a living work of art. And so this is um, Sinzo, who's a, a graffiti artist. And his work was something like three meters long and a, and a meter high all in bacteria. And it's kind of amazing for the first day and then the next day you really don't want to be in that room because it's a bit smelly. Yeah, um, yeah so we've, we've done lots of art with these. Um, I love collaborating with artists, getting people to see bacteria in different ways. And this one? Yeah, so this is the same. This is, um, but this is a liquid version of the bacteria. So these are 3D printed squid that we filled with bacteria and then uh, sort of hung up in a little tent in Western Park for um, an exhibition called um, Art in the Dark a few years ago. Oh, what again, happened that was, to that? Is that? Oh, it, it finished, unfortunately. Mm, yeah, good. it was good. so much fun. Um, and, and that was something where uh, I'd done some videos about bioluminescent creatures um, with an, a, a guy from um, Australia, and we just put them up on on YouTube and somebody saw it being shared and it was about this amazing bacteria that lives in squid and basically gives squid their kind of invisibility cloak. And she got in touch with me going, oh my God, have you heard of this thing called Art in the Dark? And I've always wanted to do something with kind of living things that glow. And I was like, have I got the bacteria for you? <laughs> um, yeah, and so we did a few things over a couple of years and I just, I love, especially that, because um, Art in the Dark was a you know big exhibition with lots of bright lights. <laughs> and then there was us in a little tent <laughs> with these little bacteria going, no, don't tip, don't tip them, don't, don't tip the, uh, you know, because somebody, you don't want to tip them over. Um, but this isn't yeah. just beautiful, this is your research. So you use bacteria that glow in the dark to yeah. tell you what. Yeah, so um, basically all these creatures that glow, so these bacteria, fireflies, glowworms, they all make light as a kind of 
chemical reaction and they only glow when they're alive. So in my lab, we take those genes and we put them into nasty bacteria and make them glow, and then we use that as a really quick way to say, are they dead or alive? And that kind of helps us say, where are the bacteria when we infect animals or can we find new antibiotics? So this infectious diseases thing, you know a little bit about it. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> and so suddenly we were inundated with this thing called COVID and you had the expertise to be able to not only understand the papers that were coming in, but to be able to communicate that in a way that wasn't just science nerdy with lots of <laughs> jargon, but was visual and beautiful. And I'm going to share one of your many yeah. incredible images. So who was this a collaboration with? And so this is Toby Morris, who's a cartoonist I've admired for a really long time. And um, I was, uh, started writing for the spin-off quite early on in the pandemic. They were like, Susie, write some stuff for us. Um, and uh, kind of towards the end of February, I was writing, I wanted to write about this um, thing that I'd been seeing shared around, which was this graph called Flatten the Curve. And I was like, oh, I kind of that, that version that's going around is really pants. Um, we need a better version because it was all about how our actions will help. Uh, and so I got in touch with my editor, Toby Manhire, to say, hey, I'd love like if we could do a version of this. Do you think Toby Morris would be interested? And within an hour, Toby Morris and I were on the phone. We'd never, we'd never met before. Uh, and yeah, we made um, Flatten the Curve, which went viral and started... Oh, this lady held it up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and you know what? Oh, God, when she did that, I'm like, it's the wrong one! So what I realised within like a day or so of this going viral was that it's totally the wrong chart. Um, and obviously, flatten the curve is... Uh, is well, it's a good message if you're trying to not overwhelm your hospitals. It's not a great message if you're trying to stop people getting sick. And so within two days, we had redone it um, according to this really great uh, Lancet paper that was all about elimination. And so we made a new version, which we called Stop the Spread. Unfortunately, that one didn't go viral. And... And the Prime Minister didn't hold up the right one. Um, so she held up that one instead, uh, whereas the other version shows... So it has the first bit at the top, and then it shows elimination, and then it shows what happens if you lift your brake, feet off the brakes too soon and you see the waves coming back, which, of course, is what we see. And that was in The Lancet uh, in January, February last year. And your collaboration and all of your images were picked up by the World Health Organization and put onto the where, their website? Yeah, so it's, so it's gone completely mad. Um, and, uh, On then, an average of 7.8 million views, I saw. <laughs> um, and especially that one, actually, the, the previous one, which was our... Um, so the, basically showing um, transmission chains and how you can stop transmission chains. And yeah, we, so we released them under a Creative Commons license. This was something that um, I was really keen on and I was like, oh, I don't know how Toby's going to feel about this being a creative, but he totally got on board. And that meant that they were free for anybody else to adapt. Um, we just wanted them out there. You know, the, one of the reasons I've loved this kind of thing, the, the reason I've done animations before is because it doesn't matter about the language, you can translate them. Um, and so, you know, th this is what we wanted to do, and that's what happened. And actually, the, the one of this, the translation of this that I've seen that has, that has impacted me the most was that we got contacted by somebody who um, uh, works for, with the kind of youth justice system in America, and so they, they adapted this to stop children dying of COVID. And it's things like, don't arrest that child, and it was just so confronting. Uh, yeah, and then basically the, the World Health Organization keep, kept getting sent it, people going, hey, have you seen this stuff? Um, and they ended up contracting Toby and the spin-off to um, do stuff. So it's just been absolutely surreal to see basically what Toby and I do is now I think about what's the messages that need to go out in the next months. We will work on something, we'll kind of do it in New Zealand and then it will basically get proposed for the spin-off and uh, for WHO and then they'll kind of adapt it. And so like their page on vaccines is based on my piece <laughs> that I wrote for the spin-off and it's just incredible to think that you know millions of people are seeing that stuff. Literally it's millions. Insane. Talking about surreal, so Susie and I, we were doing some communication on COVID and we were going to be on Seven Sharp and because of distancing, we did it at my our office. <laughs> And Susie said, oh, yeah, I can come to the office and Seven Sharp will be there. She's like, oh, I'm just going to bring a film crew with me, though. <laughs> and I was like, oh, she's like, oh, because they're making a documentary about me. So yeah. your How whole that... weird, bizarre, amazing life during this lockdown period was recorded. Yeah, so for basically for three days, yes. <laughs> so the question, so the, what happened, it's weird, um, was that this, I got this email from a lady called Gwen Isaac, who's a filmmaker, saying, uh, so I'm supposed to be in Japan making a documentary 
I can't go to Japan. Uh, can I make a documentary about you? Um, and that it was just like, oh, geez, no. But one of our close friends is a historian. And all I could think was her talking about document everything, keep everything. You have no idea how important this stuff is going to be for historians. So I just, so I said to Gwen, sure, come. Because all I could think of was Kate <laughs> going, yeah, friend Kate. this stuff is gold. Yeah. And it's been so interesting now with us having all these sort of one year anniversaries, people going back, oh, what? I wish I'd documented that. And I'm like, yeah, I had Gwen on her camera. <laughs> um, and it was just Insane, yeah. And so she made this little um, eight-minute, which it's is lovely. Just, you can see it online. It's it's just that beautiful. it's like eight minutes of the, you know the three days before. We but went it gives a lockdown. real sense of how much you were having to do over all the day. You were on TV all over the world. Yeah, it's just basically eight minutes of my phone of my phone ringing, of various phones <laughs> ringing, of people bringing me ringing phones. It's just for eight minutes. Of this and kind of, that's you know, like. <laughs> part of the journey. So you you kept you keep going. We're talking to you about vaccines now and helping yeah. people understand how those things work. You and I worked together making sure that everybody was included. So we did this first ever um, at the so Beehive. Cool. It was a press conference for children. For children. It was which, awesome. Making sure that we have these conversations. Mm. And you were recognised as BBC's. Person, well, one of the, yeah, they have a hundred women around the world, and um, yeah, who, most inspiring know, people most inspiring to watch or something, yeah. and yeah, and then I got and it, so it, I think they I think they get it from like talking to all the their, their journalists and things who have you spoken to or who have you seen this year, yeah. and so I got put on that list, which was just because you literally saved lives. You helped all of us mm. just figure out what was going on in a time of chaos. Yeah, it's a weird thing. <laughs> so we've celebrated Susie, and we all know she's amazing. But behind the scenes, you were fighting some other fights. Yeah, it's been quite horrid. <laughs> um, so those of you who are on social media, and this is going to get quite serious, um, will know that Susie has been trolled like I have not seen anybody in my life be trolled. And I honestly don't know how you do it. And thank you for... I would have quit social. <laughs> I would have just gone, I'm done. But you have stayed there to have conversations. Yeah. I've got much better. I didn't use to block anybody because I just felt that was wrong. And now I'm just like, nah, you're basically a racist bigot. So, so you've collected... You. Some, you, well, you've <laughs> it's true, right? It, and I talked to Anna about it. Whose, value, whose opinion do you value? You got bombarded with letters, with texts, with emails, with formal correspondence and social media. I'm going to mm. share, and you gave me a lot, and I had to just cherry pick a few. <laughs> I'm going to share a few of the messages that were sent directly to you. Yeah, these are my phone messages. Text messages, Text messages. these are. Yeah, I'll let I had you read a, them. I had an amazing one. Um, I actually don't know what I. I so Whenever you say amazing, I don't know. If that's amazing. Well, good no, or amazing um, so a lady from America called my work phone, oh, um, yeah. and she left more than one message. I so it to those. turns out that you get cut off after three minutes. Um, oh my gosh, she it's just was amazing. Amazing, yeah, it's a bit scary. Probably crazy. Yeah, women like you, and yeah, yeah, all about my hair and my weight and my everything, and I'm the reason why everybody's dying. And it was just, oh gosh. So people do seem to blame you for death. Yeah. Yeah, I don't quite get that. Well, right. I guess it's because there is this, you know, there is a, there is a real, there are people who are spreading this, you know, um, we we can't do the kinds of things that we've done. We can't do these restrictions of movements to save other people because it's bad for everybody's mental health. Like as though living in a pandemic is not bad for your mental health either way. Um, yeah, and so I kind of get blamed for the consequences of, I don't, I don't know, I, I'm not sure who's dying, but. And it's then, my fault. <laughs> it's your fault. And then people try and discredit you. So there are certain yes. people. Oh, yes. My friend Richard. Um, oh, my goodness. If you've been following this tale. This is a great story. So he doesn't believe you have a PhD. Yeah. And he is going to prove that you are yeah. fake. Yeah. So he, he, he thinks either I don't have a PhD or that, it's, uh, that I'm misrepresenting my qualifications. Um, so the complication is that I studied at a research institute, a government research institute in the UK in Oxford. I wasn't at Oxford University. And I'm always really clear about that. I, wor I worked in Oxford, not at Oxford. And if people say you were at Oxford, I'm like, no, 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 I wasn't at Oxford. Um, but he, he, wants to, he wants to see my PhD and he couldn't find it online. I mean, it was like 20 years ago. Uh, so he put in an, an official information net request to my employer now, who of course don't have my PhD, um, asking all sorts of details. And he's got, yeah, he's kind of ranted on his blog about it. Um, and then he's now just recently contacted the institution in Scotland 
uh, that I got it from were the kind of list of demands. And, and it's all things like, so the fact that it's not in their library, so that's, that was one of the surprises to me is it isn't in their library, because when you do your PhD, you have to submit you know, a number of, of them when it's all finished, so they can put one in the library. Um, so it wasn't there, so that immediately was like, oh, well, it's obviously not true. Uh, then he was like, well, maybe MI6 have it? I mean, he's got a whole bunch of theories. He I'll, I'll tell you what happened is that when I finished, I was not living in, so at the university is in Edinburgh. I was not living in Edinburgh. In fact, by then I'd moved to London. I, e I sent, physically sent, several copies to my PhD supervisor, one which was for him, one which was to be passed on to the library. Um, and then it turned out he never passed it on to the library. And the way I found this out is so hilarious. It's so New Zealand. So I, he, the day I got the email from Edinburgh to say this man, well, just to say we've had a request for this information, I'm like, oh, geez, it's Richard. Um, uh, and I was giving a talk that morning um, at an, uh, the annual conference of the emergency departments in New Zealand. So this is like emergency doctors and nurses. And they'd asked me to do a women in, in medicine talk. And they were like, you know, can you just tell us what it's like being a woman in medicine? I'm like, oh, yeah. So I talked about this email that I'd had. And then this woman comes up to me and goes, oh, my sister-in-law is married to your PhD supervisor. <laughs> and then she's like, and I've been texting her. Oh, and here's the picture of your PhD thesis on their bookshelf. So then we got them to email, and now it's been sent, couriered there, and it was just like such a New Zealand story. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's obsessed. I mean, he's really nasty. He thinks, oh, yeah, he's just weird. So we're going to move to some really nasty stuff. I have seen some things, and the internet can be a horrible place. These are just some screenshots of mostly Twitter, but I have seen this on all oh, of the social platforms. Oh, these are Facebook. These ones are Facebook. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, of what people write with their accounts. I know. We about know who you, you are, people. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. And the things that they think is okay. Yeah. When you're only there talking about science. And I found it really interesting because you did a side by side presentation with Professor Sean Hendy, who is <laughs> a male, and you were talking about the same things. Yeah. And it was on a news breakfast channel, and underneath all of the comments <laughs> were hate for you. Yeah. And he's a physicist, right? This is not that, his that field. That was what was hilarious, was that they're like, she's a bacteriologist. It's like, yeah, and he's a physicist. Like, I know way more about infectious diseases, but it, it's so gendered. And that's, that's, that was the first, like, you know this, and we've seen the research, but when you see it, like, there's the pictures of us side by side, and then all this abuse, it's like, wow. Yeah. So... We're talking about resilience today, and you are probably the most resilient person I know to still be on social with this stuff written about you. How, how do you do it? Yeah, so I feel like you're seeing me in my resilient phase, and it may well be that like in a week's time I'm not in my resilient phase. I've certainly had ups and downs, so it will very much depend on how I'm feeling, if I've just had a grant rejected <laughs> or something like that, something horrible is going on at work, then I'm less resilient. Um, but, you know, this, this shit is just not right. It is just not... And, and one of the reasons I, I kind of refuse to give up is or, or be silenced, because I have done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. And this kind of behaviour... I mean, this is, the, this is what leads to violence, right? People don't grab a gun and start shooting people from nowhere. It starts from little steps. It starts from abusing people in different ways, having, you know... It, that starts somewhere. And so by... You know, when I call this out on social media or anywhere... I'm not asking for any sympathy at all. I just want people to see it. I want to see where it starts. And I want to see that I want people to see the stuff we should be calling out and saying, this is not acceptable. This isn't free speech. This is bullshit. Why would we treat people like this? So that's kind of, you know, so I'm thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I don't feel I've done anything wrong. And I'm surrounded by people who are, you know, are just kind of looking after me, um, mm. and, and I wouldn't be able to do it without them. But, and, and I also wonder whether, as, as I've got more popular, not popular, that's the wrong word, just like more visible, I wonder whether my family feels, you know, it's good to keep her grounded. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's serious, right? So Billy yeah. TK talks about you yeah. all the time. He calls yeah. you multiple. A Satanist. A Satanist. Yeah. A Satanist. With, he calls you a Satanist with purple hair. And I'm like, he needs to get his eyes I tested. Know. It's I know. I wondered whether there's like pur the purple is just the color thing and pink but doesn't But he has somehow. got, and he has many followers, mm. and he has started to make them turn against you. Yeah. And then recently, something quite scary happened. Yeah, so um, I was called by a journalist um, to say that, hey, did you know that your home address and your phone number and your personal email is up on 
uh, BitChute, which is the place that YouTube, when, you, when people get kicked off YouTube, they go to this website. Um, and uh, this really quite horrible woman uh, was having a big rant, and yeah, she put and she put a picture. <laughs> she put a picture actually of my neighbour's house, um, which <laughs> slightly concerned me. Um, uh, but you know, the, yeah, putting up my personal details and saying we're going to come to your house and everything. And uh, I did freak out mainly because we weren't at home; we were away. And I was like, oh my god, the cat's on her own. The cat's on her own, and they've just shown the neighbour's house. Is everything going to be okay? Um, and it was like 10 p.m. at night. Um, yeah, so I had to call the police. And uh, and really interestingly, so she is on their list of known people. Um, but there's nothing in it. Like they're just like, well, she's a bit sweary. It's like she's more than a bit sweary, she's a bit scary. Um, but, I mean, I guess at least they know who she is. Uh, yeah. And this matters because you have uh, yeah, a daughter. Yeah, I, I have a family, yeah, at home, who I worry about. Actually, I don't talk to her about some of that stuff. She, and I don't, I don't really show She's. I think she sees it a little bit, but um, I try not to talk about it with her. Uh, yeah, she's not quite that little anymore. She's 14 now, so... Um, and, I, and I, it's kind of interesting. She's 14 and has no desire to be on social media. Yay. <laughs> right? Yay. So because I'm she's kind not of safe from reading that. all of this yeah. stuff that yeah. you're having to deal with day to day. So one of the things I find fascinating about your research is you have been in infectious diseases since I've known you. And every time I've known you, the funding's <laughs> fallen through. You've been rejected for a grant. New Zealand has gone, eh, this infectious diseases thing, it's not that yeah. important. We're not going to fund it. No big deal. And you have been the only scientist I know who's gone, well, screw it. This is yeah. important. I'm going to get my money elsewhere. And you've done crowdfunding. You've set up like a kit. Um, we all want to help you. <laughs> and so, I'd love your help. <laughs> <laughs> if people want to help you and your research, because it's not being funded right now, because it's mm. not one of our priorities in mm. research, which seems crazy, I have a little link here. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, well, so the, um, the university have basically just made a, a donation site where people can donate. So what we've done for quite a long time is... Um, we, so there's two really big projects in my lab. So one of those is looking for new antibiotics, and we're doing this with uh, from New Zealand fungi. So we get people to sponsor a fungi. It's about $250, and we basically allocate you a fungi, and then we tell you how your fungi is done. Um, and at the moment, we're, we're working really hard trying to get some online tools so we can actually... so we can point you to where the data is so you can see how your fungi has done and then what the consequences of, you know, like have we found any compounds from it and stuff. Um, but actually the project I really, really want to fund, it's been like my, um, and it's the one I haven't really crowdfunded but I really should, uh, it's, a, it's a real labour of love for about the last 10 years. I have been wanting, I've been doing these experiments in my lab trying to understand how microbes evolve. And so in terms of infectious diseases, the question I wanted to ask was, do they evolve to become more infectious, more deadly, that kind of stuff? So we started these experiments 10 years ago. We've had no funding over 10 years. So it's been very, very slow. But about three years ago, we found the answer, and that was they become more infectious. So we had these, like, basically eight, kind of think of them as transmission chains going, uh, sorry, 10, and eight of them became more infectious. And so for the last three years, we've been trying to raise money to say, how did they do that? Like, what's the changes they've made? Because if we can then, this doesn't apply to viral infections, but it applies to bacterial infections, we can start looking looking for those changes in the real world. So exactly the kinds of things that are being done now. And, and it's so interesting that if, um, you know, the, the kinds of experiments that are being done now, we are, we, scientists are having to say, like, do these ev evolutions kind of in the lab and say what mutations matter and then see if they pop up in real life. We did those experiments for this particular bacteria 10 years ago, and we've still not been able to um, fund it. So that's the thing that I really, I'm like, oh, geez, it's like, yes, we wanted to do this. We've been doing this on the smell of an oily rag because we want to know what are the changes that are happening? How can we, you know, then predict what might be coming towards us? And it just shows, you know, we've, we've um, this has been a big thing for me for many years, trying to say infectious diseases are really important. I know you don't think they are. We've got this tsunami of antibiotic resistant superbugs approaching us, uh, and then we got knocked over by a pandemic instead. Um, and, you know, and people are going, oh, yeah, you're right. Infectious diseases are important. And the really awful thing now is that this is setting back, you know, I mean, progress in infectious diseases so far. Like, I think yesterday or the day before was World TB Day. And I was reading that... Um, TB is in tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, yeah. And... Um, there's a big campaign to try and reduce deaths from tuberculosis, and they reckon this has set us back maybe five, ten years. 
And that's, that's a disease that a third of the world's population has mm -hmm. that kills, I mean, it's the, it's the number nine killer in the world. It's more deaths than, than HIV. It's just incredible. Uh, and, you know, because of disruptions to treatment, to disruptions to people being, um, being uh, you know, being diagnosed, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's just, oh, it's just unbelievable. Um, it's, yeah, so on that note, um, it, it's just, you know, but, but, what, but what COVID has taught us, you know, that we've got vaccines in arms like a year after identifying this organism. I mean, that is just phenomenal. And how this is going to impact on new vaccines mm -hmm. for other things, like already they're starting to, 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 do, to use the mRNA technology to see if they can make vaccines for malaria. I mean, malaria is one of the biggest killers in the world. So it's, it's also just been amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'd still rather we hadn't had the pandemic, but... Mm. Um, but I think it shows the money thing really yeah, can... It, it is all about money. You know, the fact that everybody, you know, everybody has every right to be frightened about how quickly everything's happened. But actually the reasons it's happened so quickly is because it takes, it normally takes time to find the money between each step. If you're doing trials, you've got to, you know, you'd normally line, you know, have one after the other with big gaps in the middle. Shows when you just shove all the money at it and you do everything in a really kind of staggered quick way. Science is and in, quick. In an hour, in, in an hour, not in an hour, in a year, you yeah. can make immense progress. But you know, those vaccines would not have been there had it not been for 30 odd years of basically public funding of universities, of those kinds of things. Um, Doing what you're doing, doing every day. Doing what we do, yeah. And not giving up. And, you know, the mRNA vaccines especially, you know, that story is incredible. Uh, the lady, I keep forgetting her name, but we wouldn't have it without her. Uh, you know, this incredible um, scientist who was told, oh, this isn't working, this isn't working, you should give up. And she instead took a demotion to carry on working on it. Um, shit, I really should remember her name. Um, she's amazing. Um, and, and, and ironically, she's not going to make huge amounts of money because she doesn't own any of the patents on the stuff, but... Amazing. That's another that's another matter. Dr. <laughs> Susie Wells, I think we would all like to say, number one, thank you for keeping us all safe. Thank you for doing all what you do with all of the stuff that's going on behind the scenes. If we can support you, this is how to do it. But yeah, you're up a uh, finalist for New Zealand of yeah. the year. So fingers crossed with that. Everybody, Dr. Susie Wells. Thank you. <laughs>